So does anybody have any questions about anything before we start? So got the chat open, got the screen share going. Anybody have any connectivity issues or anything? All right, so I guess we'll just go on. Um, so we're talking about intermolecular forces. So these are forces in between molecules. And uh, we talk a little bit about the different types. So, and the strength of them, let's talk about some of the, um, the results of having them. So first of all, viscosity. So viscosity is defined by the resistance to flow. So uh, sometimes an oceanographer will yell at me, I think, I think water has a pretty high viscosity. Like, oh, no, no, it's got a low viscosity. Well, I guess it all depends. I guess for me, when I swim, I, when I, I can I like to swim and I can, you know, push, you know, I can push the water and I can feel that resistance to flow. So that's viscosity. And, and some things flow very easily. Uh, some things do not flow so easily. There's a saying, maybe you've heard of it, um, slow as molasses in January. That's a saying more frequently used in the mainland. So molasses is, is like, a, I mean, it's a syrupy thing, but it's really, it's really, really thick. And in January, it's cold. So it tells you something. Viscosity uh, tends to go, is, is lower in higher temperatures. So if you want to, if you have a high, if you have this, like a very viscous thing, like, uh, like tar, tar is very viscous. I guess compared to water, <laughs> compared to water, tar has a very high viscosity. Uh, how do you pour, pour tar? You heat it up, heat it up enough, and then you can pour it much more easily. So that's viscosity, resistance of flow. Uh, and there's something also called capillary action. And if you see here, there is this image here of a capillary tube. So someone is getting uh, a finger pricked and then the blood is being drawn up the tube. And that, that, uh, the fact that you can draw liquids up a tube, that's known as capillary action. And if you've also noticed, our blood vessels, the tiny ones, are called capillaries. And so capillaries have a nice feature for us biologically. So, I mean, our heart, our heart is a very powerful muscle, but it, it, is, it is weaker than it has to be because of capillary action. So the idea is that the blood has an attraction to the blood vessels. And so as, as you know, we have a heart beating and, and then the blood flows to areas like your fingertips, the, the blood gets to very far away by, uh, by we call those blood vessels, the, the one at the end, we call them capillaries. And uh, that's a feature of our circulatory system. The, the, um, the arteries are very large uh, coming from the heart and they slowly shrink as it goes away from the heart. And then because of that, this intermolecular force can be utilized by our body so that the heart doesn't have to work as hard. So it's, it's a energy saving feature that our, our bodies have. Uh, similar to capillary action uh, is the idea of a meniscus. And I don't know if you have an in-person lab or not, but uh, so uh, the meniscus, so here on the left, you have water and on the right, that's mercury, liquid metal mercury. And so actually the intermolecular forces for mercury, well, I guess it's interatomic. So it's, it's quite large. So mercury, liquid mercury has a very high amount of force between the, the, uh, the well, the atoms. And then there's water. And the, these are glass tubes. So uh, glass, so uh, glass has at the surface, at least silica glass has hydroxide. So OH is, so it's silicon attached, attached to hydroxides and that's a hydrogen bond, right? So you have a hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen. So now you have hydrogen bonds that can, can be formed between the silica glass and the water. And the effect of it is the water gets drawn up the tube or the, at, well, the, the edges of, of the surface. And uh, what's also interesting is if you have plastic, say if you have a, like a plastic, I, I, I used to have lab kits for uh, distance education. 
And I was playing with the lab kit. And like the first thing I noticed, like, oh, I can tell the students about meniscus. And I poured some water and I'm like, oh, there's no meniscus. And I was like, oh yeah, of course it's plastic. Plastic is, is hydrocarbons. So it's gonna be uh, not nonpolar. It's not gonna be any, not much attraction between plastic and water. Whereas glass, glass has quite a bit of attraction. So, and hence the meniscus. And also for mercury, I can erase this. You can see with the image, it even, even goes up over. So that's like the anti-meniscus. And uh, if you ever wonder uh, like something like BBs or ball bearings. So like they have really, you know, there's really like there's really round pieces of metal. And if you wonder how many of those are made, especially the small ones, I mean, if it's a really big sphere, it's, it's not gonna be made this way. Uh, but it's, it's real easy to make tiny spheres of metal. You just have to pour molten metal and uh, it just forms spheres naturally because of the, the, the forces in, in a sphere is the most e efficient in terms of uh, the, um, uh, well, surface area to volume. So the, the sphere has the, the lowest uh, surface area to volume. Uh, although that doesn't work for all liquids. So water, if you've seen water, they have like kind of teardrop shapes. We even say tear, like a uh, rain. Rain does not have a perfectly spherical uh, size. And, and the reason is uh, because uh, it's the inner molecular force aren't strong enough. So, or the inner atomic, I should say. Well, I guess for metals it's inner atomic. Uh, the, the metallic bonding, well, uh, forces is just a little higher. It's not than, than, uh, than for liquid water. And then by gravity, and it's going in gravity, it, it elongates it into the, the teardrops shape. So it's, it's more, I mean, more than just chemistry, of course. Uh, so chemistry is not everything. Unfortunately, I wish it was. No, I'm kidding, of course. So, uh, and then the next thing I talk about is surface tension. And uh, this is a good one here. The surface tension of mercury, like I said, is, well, it, it has that, the intermolecular forces have it, beat up and that's and that's from the surface tension uh in the surface tension uh so on a liquid surface there's like it's kind of like a like well I'm, I'm trying to intertwine my fingers like a net it's like the, the the intermolecular forces are almost like a net and uh this happens for all liquids and you can especially feel it if you've ever belly flopped before like you've ever if you ever jumped into a waterfall or into a swimming pool and and if you don't angle yourself right, you can have your stomach and smack. And what happens at the moment of impact is the, uh, the, you're, you're trying to push the water molecules out of the way. And what the water molecules do is they have the, the, the force, the, the, the intermolecular forces between them. It, um, those forces link and then, and then the water pushes back. So if you've known uh, Newton's third law, I think, yeah, Newton's third law, every action has an opposite and equal reaction, right? If I push this way, the, the force, me pushing here, this object is pushing back at the exact same force. So, so if you belly flop, you're feeling the equal opposite Newton's third law force from the intermolecular forces, the hydrogen bond network of water. So that's the nature of a belly flop. And uh, besides uh, that we have, uh, so with surface tension, uh, there's some insects on, on the mainland uh, that, and, and there's a few here in Hawaii as well, I don't know their names, but we, we called them water striders in, um, in, in uh, the mainland. And they can, the, the bugs can walk on water. And I, that's, this is my, uh, you know, limit of my artistic abilities here. My, at least I have six legs, right? So that's an insect, insects have six legs. And if you ever look closely where the, um, the legs are for these insects that walk in water, there's gonna be a little, like a little divot in, in, the, in the liquid water. And what that's doing is it's, it's relying on the surface tension of water to keep it not sinking. So, and of course there are certain chemicals called surfactants. Surfactants are things that uh, take away the surface tension of water. So that, uh, there's a lot of soaps, so detergents, you know, bar soaps, uh, liquid soaps. These are also called surfactants because they break down the surface tension of water and make it easier to clean stuff. So uh, this is, I, I like this stuff. I think this is really cool. Like uh, when, when it comes to talking about chemistry and 
I'm like, uh, I, I know 161 is pretty heavy and in, in many different concepts. And I, 162 is neat. Uh, we'll get into another concept today that's going to be a little difficult. But uh, there's fewer concepts, but there's also a lot of so what's. I mean, I think this is cool that we have shapes of molecules. And we learned about that last semester. This semester come along, like, oh, they're molecular forces. Oh, and they actually have things that, that matter for us. And things like how we make BBs or ball bearings, or also like mercury with all the, uh, with a huge amount of surface tension in mercury. And uh, whenever I see mercury, I, I don't know, I, maybe I'm showing my age, but I, I think of an awesome movie called Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Uh, they use the, the T-1000 was um, like, the, they, they have uh, mercury. They used mercury for a lot of those scenes there. And I, I think about that a lot. I, I, uh, I rather enjoy that movie, but I know it's, I'm probably showing my age. It's probably like on like Turner Moody Classic now. <laughs> Anyways, okay, um, moving on. Process of vaporization. So vaporization is a dynamic equilibrium. So dynamic equilibrium, meaning that a lot of things are going on. So uh, I think I've, I guess I haven't told this joke yet this semester. So I was, I was uh, sick one time and, and, and in graduate school, and I, I remember I was at home, I missed a, a week of work, and my advisor came to me and said, he was like, Mike, you're, you've been really sick lately, what's going on, you, you just haven't been doing anything, he's like, yeah, that's true, but on a molecular level, I'm teeming with activity. And I remember my advisor started laughing, he's like, oh, that's a good one, and, and I got out of trouble for being sick, I guess, he, you know, I don't know, maybe he was just concerned. He, it, of course, sometimes, you know, when your boss just talks to you, you feel a little threatened. So, you know, just right now, you know, it looks like I'm doing nothing, although I know I'm teaching a class, you know, here. But uh, I mean, I'm sitting down, let's say I wasn't talking. I'm teeming with activity, right? There's my, my muscles are, my, my paraspinus is engaged to keep my, my spine erect, right? And and the rest of my uh, core is balancing myself out so I don't fall over. Now, now of course, I slunk back down to my chair. <laughs> but I mean, that's, but then with the muscles, right? The, uh, the muscles are, they're, they're tensing up and, and some are firing, some are relaxing. And, you know, there's, there's lots of ions exchanging in my nerve cells. So I'm just, I, on a molecular level, I am teeming with activity. Absolutely team with that team. My blood is flowing. We talked about the intermolecular forces with the blood and my capillaries. Lots of stuff going on in my body right now. Same thing with water boiling. So when water boils, it's, it's a, it, like I said, a lot of things are going on. So, uh, and you can see this image here, the, um, there's a water molecules, liquid water. Some of the water molecules are escaping, but at the same time, they're also condensing. So the attraction is pulling them back down. So, uh, and then when things happen this way where you have uh, processes going both ways uh, and we, we call this an equilibrium. I mean, we'll talk about equilibrium in a future chapter much more in depth, but uh, when things are happening and it looks like nothing is happening the, uh, from, a, from an overall standpoint, that's called equilibrium. So boiling is an equilibrium process, uh, but it also, uh, gives rise to something, and you've probably heard this before, is a vapor pressure. So a vapor pressure, vapor pressure is modeled as if the liquid is pushing with a pressure on the surface. That's, that's how it's modeled. It's not how it actually is. So uh, what's going on? So, well, there's intermolecular forces. And again, that's the theme of this chapter, right? Intermolecular forces are, are holding the water molecules together, but there's also temperature. So temperature is average kinetic energy and temperature is also distribution. So if you remember temperatures, so when you have number, oops, so quick graph, uh, number and then energy for a given temperature, you have a distribution, right? It's, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, all the same. So it's an average kinetic energy. And of course, if you remember, that was the root mean squared velocity of the tip there. So if you have a warmer temperature, you have a broader, no, that's not good, that's, you have a broader distribution. So that, that in red is a warmer temperature. And if you notice here, the energy, that is the, the, the um, there's still a broad distribution, but they tend to be shifted more to the right. Let's say, Let's say that this dashed line here 
That's the amount of energy that it takes to break the intermolecular forces of water. So if you notice, uh, so I'm gonna change colors again, I'll go purple. This purple area there, uh, that's, that's the amount, that's the fraction of water molecules in that lower temperature that can break the uh, intermolecular forces. So, but then again, and I'm gonna change colors to black. So here's the fraction over here for the red, including the purple, but I wanted to have you see the purple. There's more of a fraction of the higher temperature. So that means there's more vapor in a higher temperature. You know, not surprising, we, we studied vapor pressure uh, back in chapter five. So, uh, but something to note with liquids, when the ambient pressure equals the vapor pressure, the liquid boils. So, I mean, there's, there's vapor pressure right now. So uh, the vapor pressure of water at this temperature is around 23, 24 millimeters of mercury. Um, and you can notice the water is not boiling, uh, but the vapor pressure. So let's say that I increase the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius. The vapor pressure is 760 torr or one atmosphere. And and although I guess I right now my house is about 500 feet above sea level, so it might be a little less than that, but about a, about a hundred degrees Celsius, maybe a, a half a degree below that, the water will boil. So, and that's because the, the vapor pressure is equal to the ambient pressure. And so that's where we get the idea of, of the sort of pressure on the surface of that. That, that, that comes from the phenomenon that, that water, that the, uh, any liquid boils at the ambient when the vapor pressure is the ambient pressure. So, and, oh, and I just, I did the, <laughs> I was ahead of myself. I, I didn't have to draw that. Here's the better picture. Sorry about that. Uh, and okay. So how are we doing this right? Anybody have any questions? All right. So uh, let's use these in, uh, in some calculations. And uh, this might remind you of some concepts in 161, namely dimensional analysis. Calculate the mass in water, uh, the calculate the mass of water in grams that can be vaporized uh, with 155 killing, kilojoules of heat. So to solve this problem, use dimensional analysis. So uh, let me write it out. So you start, you start off with the units that you know, and you work your way over to the units that you, that you need. In this case, it's going to be mass of water. So start with 155 uh, kilojoules of heat. Or I guess it's just energy in general. Let me make 55 look prettier. 155 kilojoules of heat, and then uh, so uh, the heat of vaporization of water. This right here. This is also known as the latent heat. So some people call this the latent heat. This is the heat of. I usually usually use the chemistry term, the the heat of vaporization. So uh, then, uh, what do we do with this? Uh, and you can see the units are kilojoules per mole. So kilojoules is on the numerator right now. So we need to put kilojoules on the denominator. So it's going to be mole water to 40.7 kilojoules. So this step here, that is the uh, heat of vaporization. That's the amount of energy that it takes to uh, vaporize one mole of water. And then the next step is, uh, so if I remember water is... 18 grams water per mole water. So next step there. And if you do all that, you get 68.6 grams of water. So that means that 155 kilojoules of heat can vaporize 68.6 grams of water. So that also tells you a few things about water. Uh, well, uh, I, I guess another common theme I've been, I uh, told you it's going to be in this chapter, water is a weird substance. Uh, and water has a relatively high heat of vaporization. So we're going to do a problem soon that has, with acetone, you'll notice that it's, it's uh, significantly lower. Uh, so water has a relatively high heat of vaporization. And maybe you've noticed this, like if you ever go to a steam room or a sauna, uh, I, I personally like the steam room better, partially because I just, like the feel of the steam in my my uh, my nose, but uh, like I can sit in the sauna for a while and it um, it takes me you know a little bit to get really hot. Uh, if I go in a steam room, though, 
snap, you know, I get hot almost immediately because you walk in the steam room and then the steam condenses on you. And when the steam condenses, it releases the heat of vaporization, it releases the latent heat. And so it gets hot fast. And maybe you've noticed that if you're cooking and you're like, say you're, you're uh, taking your, you know, boiling some soup, you get a big pot of soup and you take the lid off and then the steam comes on your hand, that hurts, that's hot, right? So on the other way, on the other hand, uh, this also, you can use uh, latent heat, heat of vaporization to cool things. So uh, when, uh, so when you sweat, with, uh, there's two things going on when you sweat. Um, one of them is, is the heat of vaporization. So when, you, when the sweat uh, vaporizes, well, the water vaporizes from your sweat, it takes the heat 40 kilojoules, 40.7 40 kilojoules per mole of, of heat alongside it. The other thing with, with sweating is uh, it changes the surface. So your, your skin is a solid. Well, you can you mostly consider it a, I would consider it a solid. Uh, and then water is a liquid. When you're wet, maybe you've noticed this. When you're wet, it gets you 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 cool a lot faster. So uh, and let's say um, so. For instance, say it's below freezing outside. I know this doesn't happen in in very rarely in Hawaii. Maybe the top of Mauna Kea. Uh, but if you go outside when it's freezing and you're wet, you get cold really quickly. Uh, and the reason is because of the, the heat transfer is different from, from a liquid surface for a solid surface. So the heat transfer happens much more rapidly. That's, that's an engineering concept. So that's not necessarily chemistry, but I, uh, the, the textbook talks a little bit about um, cooling, evaporative cooling. And, uh, and it's really more the, it's more the heat transfer uh, coefficients, the heat transfer difference than it is it will depend on the circumstance, but I, it's, I, in, in my opinion, it's more the heat transfer differences than, than the, uh, than the uh, latent heat, than the heat of vaporization. So I'm sorry, anybody have any questions? All right, so now it's your turn. So um, the heat of vaporization of acetone is 29.1 kilojoules per mole. How much heat is required to vaporize 100 grams of acetone? So, how many people are going, oh, shucks? Am I, you guys know exactly how to do this, or am I having an oh, shucks? I'll, I'll, I'll give you some time. I'll see if you can solve it. I'm curious to see if how, because I know you have to do some of the, uh, Gen Chem one, the 161 concept. So I wanna, I'm, I'm quizzing you to see if you remember. It's fine if you don't. I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll so I can see how you guys are doing. So let's see here, that's 42. So I'm, I'm seeing two people are going for D. I'm gonna try and give you guys a few more hints. So you have 100 grams of acetone. I'm gonna put acetone there. So mole acetone to 
58 grams. Ask, am I doing that right? So that's 42. Yeah, that's right. And then by the units, 29.1 kilojoules per mole. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Uh, looks like half of you started getting there. Um, so this is this is kind of the opposite of the other problem. And the answer, the answer is D. But um, this is this is the setup right here. That's that's how you set up the problem. Does anybody have any quick questions on how to do this? Is is this uh, uh never seen this before or is it just kind of like you know hey we did that back in before december and i just you know I, that's a month and a half ago and my brain just dumped all that knowledge is that what happened or or you just need or did you just need more time There's a few things that'll come back to haunt you uh with 161 not everything's going to come back to haunt you a lot of stuff with light doesn't matter uh, after this chapter, you don't have to worry about the Lewis structures, uh, and and uh, I only give easy ones from here on out. So uh, thermo is going to definitely come back to haunt you. All the other the gas laws are are important. The uh, limiting reagent, all the stoichiometry, uh, that's important. Uh, but so that stuff you'll you'll see quite a bit. Uh, but uh, much of the stuff, and I know. Chemistry 161 is just, you know, full of a bunch of different types of mental models. You don't have to know all of them, but there are some that carry through uh, now and also in many other classes. So, but anybody have any questions? Very quiet today. That's fine. I enjoy my own company. My cats look rested too. They're learning chemistry as well. And I mentioned this before, the dynamic equilibrium. So in a better picture, uh, you can see that as things are going, they are, they are both uh, evaporating and condensing. It has to do with the fact that the intermolecular forces are happening. So, uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about, I think we might even talk about it today. Um, I find that Zoom classes go at a much faster pace than face-to-face, -face. I just, we just fly through the material, uh, talk about the different phases of matter. Uh, and uh, so for instance, even when you see like a bubbling, like a boiling uh, liquid, uh, you can, you see there that, and, and one of the reasons why the, the bubbles expand, you can see that the, that there in the, in the boiling coffee pot there, the, um, the bubbles are getting bigger. Uh, that's because of gravity actually, as, as the, uh, because the weight, the weight of the water uh, pushing down compresses the gases. And as, as the gases go to the surface, there's less pressure, therefore the volume increases. That's you know, just Boyle's law, you know, and, and actually Boyle's and it's boiling. Boyle, Boyle is B-O-Y-L-E. It's not, it's not boiling B-O-I-L. It's it, the fact that they're homonyms means absolutely nothing. It was just chance. And uh, there are a lot of people like um, that, that talk about the, the different types of, of bubbles, and especially in lava. So when lava is, is uh, forming, uh, well, solid, you know, solid lava, at least I should say, as, as it's as it cooling, you, there's various, you know, uh, uh, well, it's bubbly, right? I mean, I think most of us have seen lava here in Hawaii, you know, the solid kind. So uh, I mean, and, and much of that, the, the, uh, the, the nature of, of the basalt there has to come from, the, uh, from the, the gases escaping and then having different, different sizes. And also, uh, like, I've never seen, I didn't see this in person, but I, I remember when the volcano was erupting, I, gosh, was it 20, 2016 in, in the Big Island? I remember seeing the pictures of of the the, the lava uh, going by, and and uh, I mean, that's you know, if you get too close to that, you you might be pushing to get the Darwin Award there. I mean, it was it looked it looked pretty crazy, you know, with the because um, it to me, if I were to describe it to someone, I would say it looked like a Twizzler. 
like if you saw all the pictures of it because this is it was like a like a hot moving twizzler and then and then because the, also with molecular intermolecular forces it folded it around right so it has like just like mercury the 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 lava you know was had a very high attraction to itself so it was it wasn't like flat like water it was like a twizzler and it was also shooting off bombs like the the um I think that's what they're called, the, the little piece of the solid coming off. So, uh, but also uh, an application of this besides boiling is like I said, the, um, the, the, the structure, the way that the that lava is. Okay, so I mentioned uh, that vapor pressure, that, uh, that the, when the ambient pressure equals the vapor pressure, you get uh, the, the liquid boils. And, and so for water, uh, we have it at different, different, pre uh, different altitudes. And um, if you ever look into like one of those old school cookbooks, uh, they tell you like, oh, if you're a mild elevation, add an extra 15 minutes to simmering your, your soup. Um, so if you ever wonder why that is, so uh, the, um, it has to do with uh, uh, pasteurizing whatever food you have in there. So uh, we humans, uh, you know, Another thing you learn in chemistry class, not surprisingly, we cook our food. That's one of our, our things as animals. We, uh, we tend, we can eat some food raw, uh, but we, we tend, uh, we've evolved to cook our food. So, uh, and actually a consequence of that is our digestive systems are smaller than other animals. So if you look at um, like, like apes, they don't cook their food. And in like apes, a lot of times they have the, the big bellies. And that's because they have a lot, uh, a larger digestive system than humans. And so humans, we, we cook our food and it's just, it's easier for us to break it down. And uh, one of the features of us though, it, it comes to the cost, our immune system is not as good as other animals when it comes to uh, foodborne pathogens, right? So, uh, and uh, what we, what we do, it's, it's easy. I don't know what it is in Celsius. It's 165 Fahrenheit, 165 Fahrenheit. I guess because I'm uh, with uh, just you know using you know, using you know American units, 165 Fahrenheit kills most bacteria. And when you cook food, your target, among other things, is to get uh, the the food that's dangerous to 165 Fahrenheit, and then it kills everything. And that's also as I mentioned, pasteurization. So Louis Pasteur, he found that out that if you take things and heat to, to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, it becomes very very safe. And hence the process pasteurization. So, uh, but you can see this this table here that in different altitudes. So different altitudes means that the ambient pressure uh, is is lower, and then because of that, the boiling point of water goes down. So, for instance, if you're on the top of Mount Everest, uh, water will only boil at 78 degrees Celsius. Or if you're at Denver, uh, so water will boil at 94 degrees Celsius. So of course, at sea level here, uh, we're at uh, 100 degrees Celsius when water boils. So if you're cooking uh, food, uh, at least that involve simmering, like boiling in water, using water as the heat transfer medium, it's going to take longer to cook food if you're higher in altitude. So uh, that's where that comes from the cookbooks. And um, yeah, so that, that also knows the cookbooks it only works for when you simmer. Uh, something. So uh, if you put it in an oven and roast it, it doesn't matter. So uh, that, that the, the, you don't have to adjust the timing if you're roasting food in the oven, uh, because that relies on, on the, on, you know, the, the radiative transfer of the, of the filaments. And I'll, I guess it'd also be a collision wise. So I guess it could, it could be a little less too, but it's in general, those rules don't apply for roasting things in the oven. It's more for when you boil things. The other thing, uh, we mentioned uh, dynamic, dynamic equilibrium for boiling of liquids. Um, so, was I going with this? The dynamic, um, uh, oh geez, where was I going with this thought? <laughs> I'm not getting that old yet. Um, was I going with dynamic equilibrium. Oh, it was, since it's an equilibrium, the temperature doesn't change. That's what I was, sorry. I'm, I'm too young to have a senior moment. Uh, so when you have a phase change, the, the temperature does not change. So, so boiling as water is boiling, uh, the water at, at sea level is hundred degrees Celsius. And if you're at in Denver, 
on average, the temperature, the temperature of the boiling water is gonna be 90 to 40 degrees Celsius. Also for freezing things, if you have ice in your drink and you see the, the ice, if it's been sitting there for a while and you have ice floating in your drink, the temperature of the liquid is about zero, zero Celsius, because that's the freezing point of water. Uh, and so the temperature doesn't change that much. Okay, so questions so far? All right, so uh, let me talk about the next concept. So this is a new concept. And uh, I told you that you're gonna get fewer concepts here in 162 than 161, but the catch is they're a little harder, um, but uh, mostly using the natural logs and whatnot. But uh, so um, this is known as a semi-empirical model. So two folks, Clausius, I guess it was the French, I say Messieurs Clausius and Monsieur Clapeyron, they found out that if you take the natural log of the vapor pressure and the units being millimeters of mercury, and you plot that versus inverse temperature in Kelvin, you get something that's about a straight line. And this is known as a semi-empirical model. So a sort of experimental model. So you have, so models, what is a model? Model is a representation, right? So we have molecular models, they, they're representations of atoms. So that's a model. You have a model airplane. So um, it's a representation of something. So uh, we also have exact models. And um, so uh, ideal gas law. Ideal gas law is an exact model. That's a, the perfect gas and it's derived. It's, it's a made up thing. There is no such thing as an ideal gas. So now we have models and they're called semi-empirical models. It's a new type. This is just something that we've taken a bunch of data and we've thrown it together and we've got something that works. I think the easiest model to explain this way is friction. So, and I'm sorry if you haven't taken physics, so when you say friction, so right, friction here. Um, so friction, if you study it in general physics, they say that the force of friction is equal to the, the, um, the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So it's the, I, I, well, I mean, straight, like sitting straight up to the normal force, it's gonna be the weight at a perpendicular angle, right? So it's the weight of the object, or I mean, if it's slanted, I know the normal force changes, but the, the force of the floor pushing back, then you have the coefficient of friction. And there's also static and there's also kinetic friction. So is that what the friction is? And the answer is no, that's not the friction. So the friction would be, if I wanna know the friction of my two hands, I would have to take this atom and look at the attractive forces uh, and repulsive forces over the entire surface of my hand, and then I look at the next atom, and then look at the same forces, and then I have to sum them up. And that would exactly be the friction. Let's say if that, that's the static friction, let's say it's moving, my hand is moving, that is moving, I have to do that calculation every single time. That is the, actually, the, that is the friction. That is, if you sum up all those forces, and it changes as it moves, it changes as the surface moves. So, uh, that's a very difficult thing to do. So instead, what we've done is just said, you know what? The friction, the force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction. I guess it's mu. I guess in physics they use mu. So it's the kinetic friction and then the normal force. So the force of friction is this term here and uh, we found out that it works experimentally and you can calculate this and you can find out in the laboratory experimentally and you can put charts of this stuff. It works very well. So what this is, this is known as a lumped sum approximation. So you take all of this data and you throw it into one term and that's the lumped sum. So that's an example of a semi-empirical model. And friction, I, I mentioned that friction is just the easiest one to understand because it's very simple. And it also uses a lump sum approximation. And you see these models. I mean, you'll see, especially if you go into engineering, you're gonna see them everywhere. 
And models oftentimes only work under a certain set of criteria. So, uh, and, and that's one thing, if you, if you study engineering, my, my uh, undergraduate degree is in chemical engineering, uh, it, it, you have to keep on top of the models because this model says this works on this way and this temperature for these, these types of fluids and this one works for that one. So you have to like go through and find the right model to make your calculations. So, okay. But going back to Clausius Clapeyron plot, so what, what they found out with this was, and it was not engineering. This is, this is just, they, they did a bunch of data and they plotted it and they found this relationship. So uh, it's a semi-empirical model. The natural log of the vapor pressure uh, in millimeters of mercury plotted against the inverse temperature in Kelvin kind of forms a straight line. I mean, look at it. It's, it's not really a straight line. It's kind of a straight line. Uh, but it's it's a good approximation. So uh, and uh, this is the clausius clapeyron equation right here. So the natural log of the vapor pressure is equal to, and they found out the other thing, and this is not engineered, this is just by chance, the slope of it is equal to minus the heat of vaporization over the gas law constant is the slope of that line, and the plus this natural log of beta term. And the, the, the beta term, this is the y-intercept. So this, this plot here, that, that is where the natural log of beta is. So next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to derive this equation for you. And uh, if you remember some of these rules of logarithms, I don't know if you remember them from, from pre-calc, but if you take the natural log of A subtracted from the natural log of B, that's the same thing of natural log of A divided by the, 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 the quantity natural log of a divided by B. If you have natural log of A plus the natural log of B, that's the same thing as the natural log of those two A, A times B. Also, when you have a natural log, the, the um, inverse function for that is the exponent. So if you take, if you take uh, E to the natural log of anything, the original number pops back out. So those are some of those terms, some of those equations, and we'll use those coming up. So, Let's write this out. So using this equation here, natural log of P1, actually no, I'll do P2. P2 equals minus delta H vaporization over R, one over T2 plus natural log of beta, ln of P1. So I'm just taking two pressures, P2 and P1. Same thing. Okay, I'm gonna write sheet. Nice thing with the iPad, you can cheat. And um, I'm just gonna change it to T1. So I've just written these this equation twice. And sorry, let me let me move this down so you can see it a little better. So I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna subtract these two. And so ln p2 minus ln p1, this equals natural log of p2 over p1. And subtracting these two, they, they uh, come out. So it's going to be equal to minus delta h vaporization over r, 1 over t2 minus 1 over t1. And then the natural log beta terms, these cancel out. So. That's how you get this two-point equation there. So that's the derivation for it. So, uh, and you can, you can see, you'll see equations much like this for the rest of the semester. So you'll see a, a bunch of these. So let's, let's do this for a problem. All right, and let me advance to this. Okay, but this example, uh, the, let's use the, uh, clausius clapeyron equation to predict vapor pressure at a given temperature. So methanol has a normal boiling point of 64.6 degrees Celsius, heat of vaporization of 35.2 kilojoules per mole. What is the vapor pressure of methanol at 12 degrees Celsius? So uh, first of all, you go, what the heck is a normal boiling point? And uh, so uh, I'm thinking about you as a student right now. Right now you are taking your test and you, hopefully you've dutifully done your homework and you're, you're reading this, you're like, oh man, what's a normal boiling point? And 
actually for you guys, since everything's on, online, you can Google it if you want. So, I mean, this is the place where Google will actually help you. But information, normal boiling point is at, at, the, at the pressure of one atmosphere. So here, at least terrestrial here on earth, we use, and, and also for the United States, we use one atmosphere. And in Russia, you'd probably use a bar. Russia has uh, different standard states than we do, but we're, this is, you know, this is America. So we're gonna go with the, uh, the American way of doing it. So that's our normal boiling point and it's given to us in Celsius. And if you remember, uh oh, that's, that's uh, the model is in Kelvin. So that's one thing about a semi-empirical model. You have to use the same conditions. You can't change the units. You have to stick with the units. So inverse Celsius won't work. You have to use inverse Kelvin. So 64.6 degrees Celsius is 337.8 Kelvin by the, because the, uh, Kelvin is degrees Celsius plus 273.15. That's the, that's the, the equation. So you have to remember to look that up. Okay, so uh, write down the, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. And then I have gone ahead and, and noted, you have to pick uh, P2 and P1. So uh, it doesn't matter which one you pick, you just have to be consistent with it. So make sure, and this is, uh, these are the uh, downfalls of, of doing this, make sure that the, that the pressure that you pick, you make sure you have the right corresponding temperature. Because if you, if you switch them up, you're gonna get, then you get the nonsensical answer. So, okay, uh, and uh, it's looking for the second, uh, the, the, uh, the P2 is at 12 degrees Celsius. And why did I pick P2 on the top? Um, I'll show you as, I, as we go through, we're actually going to, uh, to it'll, it, it's, it's actually easier that way. Let's say you did it the other way and it's fine. You just have to invert your answer at the end. It's not a big deal, but okay, so. For me, the way I solve these problems, the way I like to do these problems, I like doing all the algebra first. I, I'm looking at a textbook right now and, and they do it a little bit differently. So let me, let me show you the, the math. I, I love doing math this way, it's kind of fun. So uh, I'm gonna solve for P2. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take E to both sides. You take E to both sides and when you do that, it gets rid of the natural log. So when I, when I take E to both sides, the natural log comes out and let me, oops, that's the inverse. Let me move this over. So I've done that. And so P2 over P1, the quantity is equal to E Euler's number exponent to the minus heat of vaporization over R uh, times the quantity uh, one, uh, one over T2 minus one over T1. So then the next thing I do is I'll multiply both sides by P1. Actually, I can just move it. So I can move that here, P1. It's good to make sound effects too. Make sound effects when you do the math. Okay, so that's, I, like I said, for me, myself, I like to go ahead and put all the, do all the algebra first. Now we put in the numbers. So the numbers, it's gonna be our unknown is P2 equals P1, 760 millimeters of mercury. I'll go ahead and times E, the minus heat of vaporization. So minus, and this is myself. I always write out that in joules. So that's, that's just me. Uh, I, I uh, rather than put it in kill and write kilojoules, I just write it out in joules and I do all the conversion at the end. So this is, this is, the Mike Ferguson way of doing things. If you wanna do it another way, uh, you wanna put in kilojoules, that's fine too. And I'll just put the joules here and then 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And then the units, so T2, one over 285.2 minus one over 337.8. And you throw that in your calculator and you get 75.4 Tor. Okay, 
So let me talk about this answer and let me talk about the math. So, and when, when you do calculations, I, I implore you to think about what it means. So, and this is kind of like, a, for me, when I do a problem, I kind of like, I kind of go back and like, does this make sense? So uh, maybe you've had that and you go talk to like a professor in office hours and like, well, does your answer make sense? Like, well, this is what I got, like, does it make sense? And you kind of dance around. This is, this is what we mean by does it make sense? So first of all, does the number make sense? And so uh, 12 degrees Celsius, it's a lower temperature and I'm expecting it to be lower than, than the, the other temperature. So it's at 65 degrees Celsius, it's, it's at 760 millimeters of mercury. It's a, and then uh, I'm expecting to go down. And in fact, I find out that it, it does in fact go down. So yes, this answer makes sense. Uh, but more than that, more than that, let's look at these numbers. So, and I'm looking at, I'm highlighting this number right here. So when, when I, and looking at this, this relationship, I see this number. So one over 285.2 minus one over 337.8. So my, my question right now is, is this number highlighted in blue, is that a positive number or a negative number? And the answer is it's a positive number, right? So maybe it's easy to look at it this way. If I have one half minus one tenth, right? One half minus one tenth, that's a positive number because with fractions, the bigger the number on the bottom, so on fractions, the bigger the number on the bottom, the smaller the whole number is, right? And of course, the other way is true with fractions. If, this, if the bottom number is small, the fraction is actually bigger. So one two is smaller than 10, but one half minus one tenth. So one half is a bigger number than one tenth. So likewise, when you're looking at this number, so when you have one over 285 minus one over 300 something, so one over 200 something is a bigger number than one over 300 something. So if you subtract one over 200 something minus one over 300 something, that's gonna be a positive number. So that's a positive number. So the blue is positive, And then the rest of the units, I guess I didn't put the Kelvin. Uh, okay, there's the Kelvin. And if you look at the rest of, of the, the numbers here, we have a negative number there. So that means, that means that this whole term, this exponential term, well, at least the top part, the top part of the exponential is negative, which means that e to a negative number, it's, it's going to be less than one. So when you, when you start doing exponents and you put the numbers in your calculator, if you have e exponent to some negative number, you're going to get a small, you're going to get a, a, a number, a fraction of one. It'll be a number less than one. Uh, and <clears throat> so if you have a number times, and, and I'm going back, so 760 times this exponent number. And we know by inspection that this exponent number is a fraction smaller than one, then we're also going to expect a number smaller than the original one. So that's, that's kind of like, okay, when, so when you're doing these problems and you, and you uh, especially if you, maybe if you get something right and you're like, oh, okay, I got it right, I just move on. Um, or even better, you can go through and think about it like, Huh, does this answer make sense? You know, and maybe say you got it wrong and, and you're like, oh, I wonder what I did wrong. I'm like, oh, temperature is right. I have the right temperature. And like, oh, I have the temp, I have the, the minus signs are mixed up or something like that. Like I, uh, you know, or I switch the temperature. If you switch, if you switch this temperature, say that I, that instead you, you put the wrong temperature there, uh, what you would end up having. Uh, so if, it would, you would get a huge number. You would, you would get like 10,000 tor or something like that. You know, you would, uh, I'm just, I'm just guessing, I don't know what it's going to be, but it, it, you'll, if you, if you, um, had the temperatures mixed, uh, you would, then, then if you do that, then, then 
337 minus oh, one over 337 minus one, one over 285, that is a negative number. That is a negative number, which means then you're going to have e to a positive number, which means it's going to be greater than one and you're going to be multiplying by a big number and you'll get an answer that's larger than that. So, and that's what I mean by like, oh, go back and look at things and then, and then kind of like, kind of, it's like, okay, where did I make my mistake? You know, and that's, and this is the kind of thinking you can do to, to reason your way through these mistakes, or also, uh, is it something you expect? So hopefully, hopefully my, you know, talking about how this works, like, you know, kind of some thinking points helps you when you're, when you're solving this problem and or checking your work. So, uh, okay, well, recap, I know I've talked a lot. So, let me recap this problem. So methanol has a normal boiling point. That means that's the temperature, that the, the, the temperature at, at one atmosphere of pressure. The normal boiling point of methanol is 64.6 degrees Celsius. And we looked up the heat of vaporization to be uh, 35.2 kilojoules per mole. What approximately is the vapor pressure at 12 degrees Celsius? So uh, I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe I can use the clausius clapeyron equation. And here is the two point form. And I'm going to go ahead and solve it for that second pressure. Uh, and uh, then I need to make sure that I put in the right pressures that correspond to the right temperatures. And I put the numbers in my calculator and I get 75.4 millimeters of mercury, tor, tor in millimeter, sorry, I use it interchangeably. It's the same unit, uh, 75.4 tor or millimeters of mercury. And then, you know, with my previous, you know, long-winded explanation, does that answer make sense? Yes, that answer makes sense. You know, I can go, you know, watch Netflix for the next half an hour because I did a good thing, right? So that's, that's the uh, overview with that. Questions with that? Anybody have any questions with logic or reasoning? All right. Um, oh, and uh, also, in my notes here, I, I usually, uh, if you want to know how natural logs work, what the mean of natural log is, so our number system. So uh, we have a, a base 10 number system. I'm pretty sure we have a, a base 10 because we have, you know, 10 fingers and 10 toes. Uh, the, the Mayans, for instance, they actually had a base 20. I guess they counted with their toes as well. So, uh, but, uh, well, the Babylonians, they had a base 61. So I guess they're the oddballs. Uh, but also the Babylonians is where we got the 60 minutes, 60 seconds kind of stuff. But anyways, uh, we uh, in the United States and contemporary mostly, we use base 10. And our number system works uh, as such, right? So when we have a number, when we have a number 123.456, uh, this, this is 10 to the zero. Uh, this is 10 to the one, this is 10 to the second. Those are the places for those numbers, right? And likewise, after the decimal point, this is 10 to the minus one and so on. And uh, then there's the rules of, of uh, exponents. So anything to the zero power is one with the exception of zero and infinity. So which are special cases. So, uh, but anything, anything that, that we normally encounter most numbers with the exception of zero and infinity, anything raised to the zero power is one. Uh, if you, and anything raised to the first power is just the number. If you square something, uh, it's 10 times, so to the second power, it's you multiply that number twice, third power, you multiply it three times. Fractions, one, ten, so something to the minus one, it's one over that number. Uh, it's something to the minus two, it's one over that number squared, and so on. So a logarithm, this is a review for the math. A logarithm is the, um, the, the inverse of the exponent. So a, the log of 100, the log of 100 is you look for that exponent. So the log base 10 of 100 is 2. So and the log base 10 of 0 0.01, because 0 0.01 is 10 to the minus 2, log base 10 of 0 0.01 is minus 2. So now uh, let's change the base. So let's look at log base seven, log base seven of 49. So 49 is seven squared. 
So if you do the log base seven of 49, and this is the change of base, you're changing the log to, to uh, base seven. So the log, log base seven of 49 is actually, it's two because 49 is seven squared. And you're looking for, it's the, it's the inverse of the exponent. What a natural log is, a natural log is the log base E. So E being the Euler's number, Euler's number, how you want to pronounce it. And uh, we, we do see natural logs in quite a bit. And you'll see it uh, more in, in calculus and whatnot. You'll see natural logs. And uh, so, but natural logs, it's a, we see these numbers pop up a lot of places in mathematics and science. So, or at least E, and, and then we have the base E system. And so that's what natural log is. It's the same thing as a logarithm, but it's just based by Euler's number. Uh, and here's a couple functions there. You can see that, uh, how they go back and forth. So, and I've been, and mentioned before that if you have anything to the net, E to the natural log of anything, it pops that number right back out. Okay. So little brief math uh, lesson for you there. So now it's your turn. So let's see how you're doing. Heat of vaporization of water is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. What is the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius? And I went ahead and, and calculated those numbers out for you. 25 degrees Celsius is 298 Kelvin. 760 Tor is one atmosphere. And 100 degrees Celsius, 373 Kelvin. And R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So why don't you try that? And uh, I can go ahead and start a poll. Gotta love the polls. Do I have a new poll? Relaunch poll, here we go. All right, let's see how you're doing. No, it's closer. It is important that you do try to do this, though, because um, so. The um, putting your numbers in your calculator, that is known as a psychomotor skill. So psycho brain, motor, you know, like doing things. So it is important for you to be able to take these numbers and put them in your calculator. So this is, I'd rather have you learn this now under the very, you know, supportive and caring eye of myself you know, so to help you alongside this rather than doing it later and, and not seeing how to do it. I'm trying to give you hints along the way if you're getting stuck. So P2 is equal to 760 E to the minus
And what you should put in your calculator is 760 times exponent open parentheses minus 4700 divided by 8.314 times one divided by 298 minus one divided by 373 close parentheses close parentheses. So two of the six have answered, and that means some of you have not. Um, can you give me some feedback? Do you just need more time? Or is there, like, uh, or I'll, I'll, well, we're coming up in five minutes here. Well, I guess, I guess I'll just, go ahead and i'll stop the poll so and i know i i wish well apparently we're gonna oh oh more people jumped on oh good so four out of four so most of you guys uh got it and and, and b is the right answer so um if you if you solve this out you get 27.9 millimeters of mercury or tor as as this so uh, when you put this in your calculator though, and it's, uh, so uh, when, when you're, so when you're inputting numbers in your calculator, so remember also uh, rules of, of operation. So, uh, and the way that, that uh, the, also the functionality of them. So when you, when you put in uh, the exponent, exp, or it's, or it's gonna be e to the whatever, whatever, I mean, if it says, if it says EXP, EXP can also mean, it depends on the calculator, EXP can also mean 10 to something. So, so be careful with that. Um, and uh, each calculator is kind of programmed uh, differently. So uh, it's gonna be E to that, or it's gonna be exponent. Uh, make sure, and let me, I use different colors. Uh, and, and Excel does this. So, Make sure when you write something that you have the parentheses in the right sp space. So you have to have that function exponent in a certain way. And also you need to put uh, parentheses around this term here. So make sure that you have parentheses in these numbers. And then also the numbers go left to right. I know it looks weird because of this 8.314 and then you multiply it but uh, the, the calculator can only do what it's told. And the order of operations are for, uh, for, cal for multiplication and division, it's left and right. So uh, what, it, what it does is, uh, let, let's say I didn't put the parentheses here. So let's say I did not have parentheses there. It would, the, the calculator would um, calculate this number out and then subtract this number. So it would get the wrong, it, it can only do what it's told. So you have to have the parentheses in there as noted. And, these, and there's parentheses in the equation too, so it makes sense. So, but uh, you don't have to uh, put, you don't have to put parentheses around here if you don't want to. You can, they, they mean absolutely nothing. It's not gonna change. Oh, and you don't have to put parentheses around this one. Uh, like I said, it doesn't mean anything, but you can, you do have to put parentheses around the, um, the subtraction of the fractions and then you carry through. But it looks like at least most of you guys are getting it. So I guess I don't need to explain it all that super in depth. Uh, but something I did want to tell you. So, so if you, so this is, if you solve this, this is the model. And it turns out 
the real answer is this. So, uh, and I, I wanted to also tell you that that's one of the things about using a semi-empirical model. So uh, if you were to go to the laboratory and measure out the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius, it's gonna be 23.8. But if you use the clausius clapeyron relationship and you, uh, and you calculate it, it's 27.9. So uh, what that tells you like, oh wait, why isn't it exactly the same? Uh, these are not exactly the same because look at the model. If you, if you look at this, this here's a clausius a clausius clapeyron plot. And notice it's not a straight line. It's kind of, I mean, it, it is, it's, it, it is a line, but it's, it's not perfect. And that's one of the things about these semi-empirical models. They're not perfect. They're not perfect. And, and uh, there's an error. There's a little bit of error associated with that. So uh, as you go forward and you look at these other, you're going to encounter, if you're going to stay in science or engineering, you're going to encounter lots and lots of semi-empirical models. And uh, with that, there's also error with them. And then, but then for you, you as the scientist and or engineer, you have to manage that error. And uh, so engineering is, is uh, one of the ways that, that they manage the error is you, you include something called a safety factor. So meaning that you, you tend to over-design things. Uh, so if I, if, I, uh, if I am designing a cooling system for a nuclear power plant and I find out that I, I need to have my, my uh, heat exchanger um, be 500 liters, I'd probably make it 1,000 liters. Right, so that's that's an idea of a safety factor. Well, maybe I guess that's double. Maybe maybe six hundred liters instead of five hundred liters. I'll make it six hundred, you know, kind of thing. So then you so a lot of times uh, you over design things uh, and and in a fashion that it um, to to protect yourself if there is if the model because the model is not perfect it's it's going to be wrong. So it's always not. I should say it's not going to be exact. There's a little bit of error. So like when you say you design things, you have to make it a uh, you have to over-design things engineering-wise. Um, for science-wise, um, it really depends on what you're doing. You know, so like, um, so if if you're just, if you're looking at the vapor pressure and and you're just trying to do it for something like, okay, um, I, I uh, what's some of the vapor pressure? I just, I want to know what the gas mixture is above the, um, like I have a, a tanker car full of, of a uh, solution. I just want to know what the vapor pressure is there, you know, just see if it's dangerous or something like that. And that this equation would be good enough for that. Let's say I'm building a rocket and I need to worry about the vapor pressure in the tank to, to get the, the balance of it right uh, as I'm, because I'm going to use this tank, I'm going to shoot uh, a, um, an asteroid from this probe and they're both moving at 20 miles a second. And my, you know, and I have to hit this target from this moving target, and I, I need to know where the center of mass is on this object. Yeah, this is not going to work for that, right? So that's that's an example of if you have a, a huge amount of really precise measurement that you need for something, you need to use something else. So, they, so that's that's what I mean. Like for you going forward, you just have to to kind of figure out what it is you know, and if if the model is acceptable, the error is acceptable for that. And I mean, I know not everyone's going to work for NASA. So it's, you know, that's, that may, that may be an extreme. I, I always thought that was cool. The deep impact probe. I like that stuff, you know, like, man, the calculations for that must've been intense, you know, for those things, but, you know, for, for many things, and at least for chemistry wise, um, doing stuff in the laboratory, it's usually not that, that much of a difference, but all right. I got one minute left. Anybody have any questions about anything? No questions. All right. Thank you. So uh, you did well today, guys. Um, if you, this may be a little 